I stand up here for the introduction, which I may find in a moment? Okay, who am I? I am, Paige gives the very difficult president of the Barnard Historical Society, who has been laboring on this for probably five years, ever since Mary gave me, <laughs> Mary gave me the uh, onion paper things to scan before we gave them over to the Woodstock department. You've got yours, Horace. Okay. And there is somewhere in here when I would find it. Ah. Oh. Okay. First, a little bit of housekeeping. If you need to use the bathroom, it is going to be in the Grange Hall, the community hall, which is down around the corner. But I suspect most of you know that anyway. But you need to know that. Refreshments will show up later. All right. How many of you are familiar with what the little brick is? Okay. This is where this was written. January 1943, page one. This issue of the East Barnard Grange News might be called the birth of a new idea. All the members of the Grange have been cudgeling their brains to arrive at a method whereby all our friends and relatives in the armed services will be assured of receiving news of their home folks at fairly regular intervals. Finally, from out of the blue came the idea that a newsletter published at such intervals as passing events indicate would be just the thing. So like it or not, here we go. It makes us very important, feel very important to know that our paper reaches out to the uttermost parts of this little old world of ours. Aside from the Reader's Digest and one or two other publications which have foreign circulations, we really haven't much serious competition. We wish to tell you that we appreciate how hard it is to read these letters when they're written on such thin paper. The reason we are using the onion skins is so that we wait is so that we can make six, six copies at once. You see, we have to t send it out to 19, um, we have to send out 19 copies and one copy for our files. That means we have to type it four times. Even with thin paper, we figure you would not mind a great deal, and it makes it easier for your editor's two fingers. We only know how to use two when it comes to typing. Everyone here at home is interested in everything you do, see, hear, and think. So how's for you to write your editor, giving us news of yourself and any funny little thing that happens to you or some of your body buddies? We know that little things happen which seem funny at the time. Just send it on. Your editor will build the story up if you just give him the facts. Your senses would never object to this kind of thing. Number two. <clears throat> Number two. The veteran, the recipient of those letters. <laughs> it does, because you are. I'm finished with num being number one. I'm just going to stay here because getting up and down these steps is... I got this to read. Okay, you have to... Hey, please. Mr. Van Elstein, would you please turn around and face the audience, bring the walker around? Okay. See, I told you, bossy, bossy. I just... She wants to see your face full front. Lord Van Alstyne, 
and testing the M1 rifle. Picking up his gear to handle the M1 rifle, I was, and I still got the M1 thumb. So then I wound up in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and done some training, and we were forming what you call the Port Academy, and what that was, we I learned how to load ships and handle heavy equipment, load ships and that. So, next thing you know, we had orders to go to Pacific. We had the number and everything. And, well, so we thought we was headed for the Pacific. So the way they organized the Army back in 1942, the day before we were supposed to get on the train, the big wheel decided that we were over 200 short to make a full battalion. So, uh, so they just went into the replacement depot and grabbed over 200. And some of them hadn't been in the Army a week, no training whatsoever. And then we did have some that had been in. I got on the train and where did we wind up? In Church of Canada. And what were we supposed to do up there? Well, to come find out, we were um, on a little car and, and the ship that came in to, uh, to build a runway to reef uh, fighter planes to reef fuel and go to the next stop, which was up at Carl Harbor just south of um, down the Hudson Straits. And so we did, went up there and done some work and then back to Churchill. And we had to stay there until the Hudson Straits froze over. We were sleeping in tents. And the morning we got on the train to come back here, it was 40 below zero. So then I wound up in, finally wound up in Africa. And I went over on the Susan B. Anthony. And I do have, I'll have to tell you this story because it's a truth in thinking. I'm not a reader, and I read about the convoys that were going under. Um, Greenland, Iceland, down in the Orkneys to get us some and supplies to England and whatnot. And it was TQ-17. There was a destroyer on that name of the name of it was Rome. Well, they, the big um, British Admiral thought that the Germans were going to bring out that big battleship that he had. So he called off all the American Navy and let him let them go. Well, that fact. Then, when I wound up in Italy, down I was sitting down there in Salon, just opposite Paisley, out on a ship before way before daylight, eating sea rations, and I saw this tremendous um, ball of flame just over the horizon. Well, I knew something happened, and later we found out that the German U-boat had torpedoed the lower. Well, it was down to over 200, there was about 70 odd that survived. And the thing is, the road went over with, with um, 
Brother Susan P. Anthony escorted. Well, they didn't think anything about that until after the war. And there was back up here on Wednesday Hill Road, there was a gentleman named that John bought a place here and said that anyway, come to find out he was on the road when it was and one of the one of the survivors. His grave was right over here. That's how small the world can be. And we just Jeff Wilson, that was his name. So I got that story. That award. And I never every time I look at it, I think of it. And anyway, so then I where I left down in Fort Myers Standard, which is near Tom, and went down to New York, and I wound up in Oran Africa. And of course I didn't get any letters for a while. And then finally I did get some from Mr. Brett and the Greek. And I saved them for the embarrassment. Well, if any of you want them that I say, if you go to Paston and go down to Beach and go 30 miles down into Mandarinian, you will find my barracks bag down in the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> but it was a ship was torpedoed. I was ashore, see, because that way they put so many of us on each ship to unload that. And it was a 36th Division from Texas. And so that's what I'm, some of those, these letters. Ah, down the bottom of the mat now. <laughs> so I was agreed that, and I did get promoted to Saturday. We had a letter from Floyd Van Alstein telling us all about the queer bird he saw running across Africa. He also comments on the size of the paper that they say. Um, French head there, it was in French Algeria, anyway. And, but we got paid in, um, let's see, in the dollar bill that was just the same as a dollar bill. And that, then the next page check, we got paid in francs. Now, and that dollar, that bill that I got that first time, I can take you up to the house and show you one of those dollar bills that I kept. And I carried it with me then from then on to invasion of um, Italy, and then up to Naples. We operated the port of Naples. And then from there I went to Nancy Hall and then back to Naples. But I kept that there. And then got on that story on, on that African part. And now we, <coughs> Boyd also sent a little newsletter clipping that had poetry on it. One side one side and a picture of a lovely lady on the other. We presume the boy wanted us to see the poem, but you can tell about these sadness, but I'm reading. Yeah. Now, let's see, November 40, 43, I was in him, Na Naples and Italy in the little ship, and loading ship. We learned that boy has again changed his P.O. Now that's the number that he sent more that would be my law. It used to be when I left the Army, it would be more that. But some pictures 
In the latter dated October 24, from the pictures we judged that Floyd had been working pretty hard. Well, we did. It was done completely 12 hours shift. There was no such thing as an eight hour to the enemy. We worked. And a lot of times, I had known the winches to be running on one ship, and it would come right along, and you step right over, and that, actually that winch never stopped. And the winter, finally, we got the port cleared out. Out of 64 birds in the port of Naples, when we went up there from um, Solano, there was just two bursts that could begin shifting. And the Germans had just sunk ship, and of course we bombed some, but they sunk everything they could think of on every pier, even the big pier, pier cranes and stuff, they dynamited them so they went, went on a hole. And uh, between the sea bees, and the Navy, regular Navy, and the American engineers, they cleared that port out. So we, and by the end of 1943, 44, the port of Naples handled more tonnage than the port of New York. And all went, and <coughs> for instance, we had a replacement that was a lieutenant in the infantry in the wounded. And he came to work with us. And he made a remark to us that he never realized the material it took to keep him on the front lines. That's the way it was. And September 44, yeah, it's down deep. Since our last letter, we had two the mail letters from Floyd Van Alstyne. The first one was dated August 10th, and the other August 31st. His address is unchanged in this letter. Floyd, Blaze stresses on the fact that he's getting fed up with doing the same thing all, all the time while here, and we can just imagine how boring it must be compared with the mad hurry burry of these farmers. <laughs> never a dumb moment. Thanks for the letter. We sure then. August 45. Excuse me, Floyd. Huh? Floyd, what does IT mean on your blouse? Oh, yeah, I remember that. We didn't get to eat. We were stationed oh, that's in the seven-story hotel, hotel building, right outside the Port of Naples. And then there was a post office that part of it was blown up some of it, and they fixed it, and so some of the others, because they were over 4,000 in that battalion. And then our headquarters were in the fascist headquarters building that we chased out of there. Uh, yes, let's see. August 6, boy, bro. Another letter seems like he and his buddy hadn't cleaned up the room good enough to suit them and so they had a big inspection. And we wound up, anyway, we were restricted for a week. We, but we knew how to get out. <laughs> we used to find out we could go upstairs on the roof of the hotel and then we crossed that roof. And jump over on to another head, root and come down. <laughs> that didn't last too long. When it, uh, they found out, they didn't say anything, but they put some big locks on the door. <laughs> <laughs> we learned that Floyd, if he 
Pacific, Japan surrender. So I love that animal. The last thing. Yeah. And the last thing is, what did you do? What did you do before you even left the service? And they said it was like that. I got to Chicago the second of November, nineteen forty-five, and I remember I came up and they were having square dance over here, and oh, I had a hard job to stay sober. <laughs> <laughs> and he was already a property owner. Huh? You are already a property owner. No, I bought it the seventeenth of November. Same house that he lives in today. Can you hear me? Okay. I was instructed that. Oh, <laughs> this is the one place where everybody can hear. Yeah. All right. I'm Mary Van Alstein Croft, and it says first thing say a bit about my attendance at the school. Well, yes, I, I attended school here, first and second grade, the East Barnard School. Before, I think if I remember right, when they closed the school, there were probably about eight students, if that. And from there, I went to South Royalton. Um, this is then, this is from one of the letters. Mm -hmm. It's from Mr. Westbrook, right? So we did not have a community Christmas tree this year as one above Uncle Sam's alphabetical boys, the writer does not remember which one, decreed that outside Christmas trees must not be lighted. This was in order to conserve electricity. Sounds like illumination eliminated. That was all in caps. <laughs> the school had its usual Christmas trees and celebration, and it was a huge, huge success this year. Two plays, one by the lower grades and the other by the upper grades, were given, both groups had their lines well memorized and certainly put their backs into the acting and general stage business. Who knows, maybe we have some developing, oh, excuse me, maybe we have been developing some Hollywood or Broadway or Broadway timber right here in East Barnard. Songs were sung by various pupils and groups of pupils. Then we had a regular old fashioned community sing song at the close of the festivities. Santa Claus, in the person of Harold Potwin arrived with presents for the kids. Some fun, some fun. Speaker 
I have this little note about, this is a newsletter item about an article that I read in the East Barnard Grange meeting, and my name is Marion Le Levitt Lavasso Whitaker, and the meeting was on July 1945 on page three. The original version omitted the word maple before sugar. The Grange program was a varied one, and I read the article on the many uses of maple sugar. This correction waited 75 more years to be made, and I don't know what that means. Because in the newsletter, it said the many uses of sugar. I mentioned it to Marian. She said, maple, of course. So I put it in here so that she could have the chance to correct it. Mm -hmm. I don't care, everybody would have used maple sugar anyway, but the way it read was, for those of us that are too young to have been rationed <laughs> with sugar, that uh, why are you telling so many people the many uses of it, something that you can't even use, you can't even get? Well, Mr. Westbrook, who lived in the brick house across from the store, is the, was the editor of this newsletter that he wrote and he read it every month at the Grinch meeting, and it was sent to all the boys in the service and the girls too. And that is what uh, I, I, re I heard all the letters he wrote. Making too much noise? That's probably better. Try it out. Beep. Talk. Okay. You hear me better now? Sometimes they don't get close enough. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the, it was quite an undertaking for him to write all those letters <clears throat> and uh, send out so many. And I'm sure they were very much appreciated. And we enjoyed hearing them. But to ask me what they were about. To this day, I can't tell you one little thing, except there's one thing that I remember in those letters. And that was a story about my brother John when he was seven years old. Ah, but he's got his own engine. Losing yeah. his finger in the gears of that old engine. And he had to, he's, he was pretending. He's, he's, he's going to read that himself. Oh, he, he's going to tell it? Yeah. I didn't suppose he would. Give him a fair turn. <laughs> yes. See, it's all okay. the But that, that's the one thing that I remember in all those letters. I, I can remember Mr. Westbrook telling about that. <laughs> if you can't hear me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, okay. All right, I'm the Leo Joseph Rodgersary, and and uh, the, the letters that, that Paige gave me were about my uncle Horace and, and my grandfather uh, Joe that was there. Uh, just a short history of where how they came here, how they've been here. They had the farm on Broad Brook, the one that uh, Bushrod Powers is at now. And, and uh, they farmed that for, for a long time. It was a uh, dairy farm, and, and they had the Jersey Jersey cattle. And, and uh, they, they used to pasture the cattle across the road where the Tom Power uh, house lives now. There was a field there, so they used to run the cows across the brook morning and night over by Tom. The farm wasn't there, and it was Mr. Broom. That, that, uh, that lived there. And, and, uh, and then, you know, Hawk Powers did a lot of logging uh, in, in, the, uh, in the winter. Him and my grandfather would uh, cut logs 
like many other people down Broad Brook, and, and uh, the group of neighbors on the brook would get together after they all had plenty of lives, and, and they, they'd wait for, for a day when the roads were good and solid, so they didn't you know, goof them up when the, when the uh, sleds would go down with these. So the, say, four or five farmers would get together and say, well, this is the day we're going to do it. And one of the reasons they did that was down in, in Sharon, because they headed towards Sharon, down in Sharon there was a, a, a grave that the, uh, one team would have a very hard time to get over. Uh, that that uh, grave isn't there anymore. It's now where there's a, there's a sand pile down there. They uh, uh, took the sand out, but there was a hill right across the road there. So what they do is they all head down to that spot, and and then they unhitch the the team that was in the rear, and, and they hook it to the to the team that was up in the front, and they pull load, that load a lot of it over the top, and then they did it with each one, and then they all went on way down to the uh, down to the mill. Uh, but in, anyway, uh, uh, here, here's the letter that uh, that Ruth again. First one is. Uh, Harsh reducer is feeling mighty chesty these days. All by himself, he dropped and worked, a, uh, worked on a maple tree that was three feet on the foot. A mighty tall bunion right here in our midst, by God. And, and then the next letter, April 1943, uh, the Ladies Community, Community Club gave a party on Friday evening, March 19th. It was a St. Patrick's Day party, and all folks were divided into teams of four, and contests were held. The Grange team consisted of Edith and Phyllis Howard, Horace Reducer, and Don West Westbrook succeeded after a good stiff competition in, in winning first prize. And the next letter is uh, April 1944, page four. Uh, Joe LaDoucher, Horace's father, is at present sharing a room at the Randolph Hospital with Jimmy Noonan. Joe has been ailing most of the winter and is, and is in for observation while Jim is recovering from an operation. It is our guess that the nurses have their hands full with those two old coots. <laughs> and this here letter is December 19th. 44, page 5. Just after the last issue, we sent out Horace Reducer arrived at the village, all excited. He had a beautiful buck, a seven-pointer weighing 192 pounds. Horace got it with a 12-gauge shotgun. The first shot was loaded with BBs, and the second with a slug. Both took effect. So we are unable to say which really did the job of killing the deer. And that's my life's work. <laughs> Hello, my name is Matthew Diesel. I've been here for just a couple of years. I currently live in Ellen and Luna Moore's home, right there in the village. And I'm going to speak about uh, this letter here in March 1943. This is regarding the rationing of the general store. The candy counter at Ellen Moore's store is in bad shape. <laughs> Something sure ails it. It has lost both weight and color. The last time I saw it there, the two tired, wizened boxes of most uninviting candy and one package of donuts. It was the best Elwin could do. It seems that the usual occupants of the counter have been drafted and sent overseas or to some basic training camp. <coughs> the same thing applies to the refrigerator. No sausage, no tripe, no butter. Imagine, if you can, these two babes in the woods, Beth and Don Westbrook, trying frantically to make themselves some butter because there's just none to be had in any of the surrounding stores. Well, if that's all we have to deny ourselves to keep you boys supplied, we certainly can rejoice. If you'll take a good, solid poke at the axis, you can have anything you want. We will go about to put power in your elbow. 
on the next letter, August 1943. Ellen Moore has been helping Galen with the hay, and as a result, Luna has been tending the silver. She does a fully good job, but there is a kind of cramped and poor style come Saturday night. Somehow or the other, the stories don't seem quite numerous, not to say so lofty. <laughs> Thank you. We're taking up a collection for one on the other side right after this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Lover. I'm uh, uh, the grandson of Dudley Lover. And this story from uh, the letter from 1943 in April, on page four, uh, is written with Henry's subject. It says, Dudley has stumbled under the soul of old from the Charles Sawyer and has since got himself a 1939 state body board pickup. The others are more than proud of their new transportation system. It is just the kind he needs to take care of his business. Unfortunately, I had a blowout a few days ago for no apparent reason. The Wonder Boys on the higher ration board have been fully and properly notified, but there are just neat none to be had for the time being. <clears throat> we hope for Dudley's sake he will be able to dig one up right away. This is a poor time to do without transportation. We think we could find an old rubber band if it would help at all. Yes, before we forget, Ever came home with a dope the other day, please forgive us. No doubt his dope box is not yet recorded. And then in July 1944, Peggy Westbrook was spending her Christmas holidays with Beth and Donna. In spite of her visit, the little brick seems kind of deserted this year, as compared with some other years. You can see other members of the Westbrook tribe just couldn't get home for Christmas. I'm sorry, Hello, I'm Joe Levitt, married to Dan Levitt, Bud Levitt, my father-in-law. And these letters are about Mary and Peggy Westbrook, who live in the Brick House. July 1943, page 4. Don and Beth Westbrook's two daughters, Mary and Peggy, will spend their vacations with them. They should arrive now most any time. The fellow has to be about seven feet tall to whisper most nothing into their shell like ears. Those best bricks never do anything by half by cracking. May 1945, page 3. Mary Westbrook has been visiting there for the past month or thereabouts. She has resigned from the job she had in the Hill University and is to leave for England shortly to work for the YWCA. She has to take along with her all her clothes and medicines. Everything she will need for the next three years as such things are not to be had in England. It takes some figuring to talk out all such a long-term project. Um, December 1945, page four. This is page three, graduation for the eighth graders, Marjorie and Mary Levitt. Mm -hmm. October 1943, page four. We have been intending to tell you all for some time that we not only have a service flag hanging in the Grange with a star for each member of the Grange who was in the service, but we have also arranged to have an honor roll which will carry the names of all those receiving copies of these newsletters, whether they are Grange members or not. You may be very sure that we home folks constantly remember that you're out there batting for the home team. I'm not sure. We found this in Bud's thing, so we're not sure if these are, this is what they're talking about. What's the problem? Okay. There you go. Thank you. You know, first thing I went down to Boston was my sister Mary Moore a few weeks ago. Mary you know, was putting in her application for the wage. A few days ago, Mark and Marion 
also named the Jeff Blossom of Memory, who this time was sworn in in October of 1888. The girls were quite excited when the cherry arrived. Emily arrived in a host of other experiences. None to be had in straight metropolis and bowels. Some fun. <laughs> I'm Joe Levesseur. I'm the granddaughter of Josephine Levitt, whom I'm reading experts about, the ones that mention her name. And the first one is from 1943, um, about her brother, Leonard Moore, and his family, who lived down the brook across from the Anderson Place in what was known as the Gibson House. And it says, the Leonard Moore had the measles, and when we say the Leonard Moore, we mean it. Just about everyone had them. Josephine Levitt went down to give them a hand, and before she could catch her breath, she had seven of them in bed at once. She must be some nurse, however, as they are all in circulation again, none the worse for wear, as far as we can see. And then in April 1945, while Bud Levitt was home, Josephine gave a party for him. Most of the village turned out and had a quail of time. It was a miserable night as a wet snow was falling, but no one seemed to care a mite. Whisk was played, and then swell snacks were set out, only to disappear promptly with much lip snatching. Hello, I'm Oxford Gibbs. Page's sister, and I'm here to I'm here to uh, read a letter about a play incident. This is from March 1943, page six. We don't know whether the next item falls under the caption sports or near accident, but anyway, here she is. One day, not long ago, Ethel Moore decided to give some of her friends a sleigh ride. Turner got out the old stage sleigh, and they started out, picking up Walter Adams, Hazel Carpenter, and the school teacher, Catherine Hollis. They brought Hazel at the dances, while Ethel stopped to visit Mrs. Slatoria. The rest continued along the wheelers where they turned around to each other. As they sighted back down the hill onto the Sulia flat, the pole broke. Turner and Walter unloaded and ran alongside holding the sleigh back off the horse's heels. Suddenly Turner tripped and fell, and the reins got away from him. It looked pretty bad for a moment, but Walter made a grab to the reins and managed to get hold of one of them. He pulled the horses around, horses' heads around, so that they stopped in the deep snow at the side of the road. Catherine insists that Walter saved her life, so we recommend him without reservation for the Carnegie Medal. Next item is from April 1943, page two. Ethel Moore gave another sleigh ride not long since. They beat that bet that Don Westbrook had probably never written in anything that didn't have a steering wheel. She invited them to join her on the trip on to the group of, excuse me, on the trip to the Gamble Schoolhouse section. Rusty Turner pitched up, and away they went in the most brilliant sunshine imaginable. But by the time they got to Parklands, the air was filled with snow, like there often is. By the time they were abreast of Sulians, they couldn't see the horse's ears. All decided to turn back, lest they be snowed in somewhere until snow, until spring, sorry. With a flourish, Turner turned 
dark valley high, and they started back by upwards. The snow had stopped, the wind had subsided, and by the time the village was in sight, the sun was shining placidly, just as if they had been, just, just as it had been at the center. Seems like Echo's sleigh rides are destined to run into trouble. <laughs> and I'm talking about Virginia Piper. Virginia Piper is my first cousin, first cousin. Her mother was Doris B. Levitt. I mean, yeah, Doris B. Levitt. Piper. And her brother was Dudley Levitt. And, and I'm Lucy. Virginia, my mom, Marjorie Nelson's first cousin. I am her first cousin, one time removed. May 1943, page 10. Virginia Piper had some hard luck a few weeks ago. She was right on, she was on the night shift and afterwards was sleeping during the day. About 1.30 p.m., the apartment house caught fire. Now, where was that? I don't Hartford. know. Where is that exactly? Hartford, Connecticut. So, okay, so Hartford, Connecticut. And Virginia was forced to make good her escape in nothing but a blouse and a pair of socks. The rest of her clothes, both warp on, pictures, etc., were all up in the apartment. Virginia had the presence of mind to grab her purse on the way out, so coupon number 17 at least was saved. But the warp bond also was mighty important. She tried to persuade the requirement to set up the ladder so she could dash up and rescue the bond. But the fire ladies were having nothing of that. Thank you. By good fortune, the bonds were later rescued, a recovery. But what the smoke and water had done to poor Virginia's clothes was something. She said she would have been better satisfied if they were burned up as then she would have a good excuse for replacing them was new. Isn't that just like a girl of that Easter time? <laughs> November 1943, page one, Boys in Service. Really, we should change the name of this department to We Boys and Girls in Service. You see, one of our gals has often joined the Marines. Yeeho! We said the Marines. Virginia Piper has landed and the situation is well in hand. She was sworn in November 5th and is to report to their duty about Christmas. Good girl, Virginia. We shall expect a goodly wad of news on your activity and regular, at regular intervals. April 1944, day four. Virginia ran across the old buddy of Dean out in San Diego who told her that Dean had been seeing some action in the and is now at Pearl Harbor. How about, how about dropping us a line, Dean, and telling us anything we have? Everyone here in the village will be mighty pleased to hear from you. September 1944, page 3. Virginia was home for about a week, arriving September 1st, just in time for the Grange camp. And what do you think? She brought home a brand new strike from one, from other two, or so on her sleeve. Yes, for private first class. April 1945, page three. Virginia has been attending her at school. She was the only girl in the class and she came through at the top of the list. Good girl, Virginia, that's showing up the near males. <laughs> I am Dan Lovett again. This is this uh, brief writer here about my father's letter. Uh, from December 1943, page 2. Bud sent an interesting book that was writing and illustrating the setup at Samson. We had no idea Samson was such a big station. Well, we knew it was next to the Great Lakes in size, but we didn't realize just how big that made it. Bud's report that the child was very good. And also, he had been assigned a pushy job as a locker inspector. Far better than swabbing down the barracks, by 
on page three. And as much as Bud Levitt up in one year and it was necessary to elect a new gatekeeper for the range. Norman Piper was elected on the first ballot. In January 1944, Bud Levitt wrote us a dainty letter from Samson on December 29th. He spent Christmas with the Braves in Ithaca and stopped overnight. What a nice story. But seems particularly impressed with the fact that the Navy barbers have reduced the time for a haircut to about 20 seconds. <laughs> you, see, you see, but what happens when we go into production in a big way? March 1944. Bud describes some full scale target practice they had. As trying to his crew, he smoked them right in the middle of the target with their five, with their five inch pay. By golly, snagging a two-foot target at 3,000 yards sounds like a pretty sharp shoot. Regular demo stuff. April 1944. Since our last letter, Buddy Leather came home for a few days leaving. He seemed kind of glad to get hold of the maple bucket for a day or so. We know he's going to make it, make it, make it a good gunner, but we don't know what kind of sailor he made. On the trip from Newport to New York, and then in November 1945, now comes uh, a nice long letter from Ray Barber. Uh, written October 20, he is on the USS Franklin Bell on the transport service. But he and his mates lost any mail that might have been, <coughs> been waiting for them at the mountain, as the whole post office mail and the boat that it was on blew away in the typhoon. Hello, my name is Marlon Bernaka Yang, and I bought more more house, and she wanted me to have it to keep it in the family, along with my pet and cats. Extra, 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 Marlon Moore and Bill Moore went and done it. That cute little fellow with the bow and arrow that we mentioned in our last issue found it at a bullseye on September 7th. Mark stuck away right after school, and before the village could walk, catch it fresh, that job was done. We suppose Mark got two checks for her first week work at school, one made out to Mark Allen, and the other made out to Mark Lord. The community got together last night, September 23rd, and they threw a family reception from Mark and Bill the grain hall was nicely decorated, and the whole neighborhood turned out young and old. And certainly show by their action that the match had a blessing. The Grange and the Women's Community Club got together and presented them with a lovely pair of soft, warm blankets. And many other folks gave them individual presents, which made white and poison. Kyle, then made a little thank you speech, and then the whole game swung out into the grand march, which opened for dancing. It lasted two, and the rest of the evening, everyone took a recess for sandwiches, cake, and coffee, which was served in the best responding manner. Man the bride who room each had a cake, and so did Josephine and Dudley Levitt, who, who by good fortune was celebrating their 18th wedding anniversary. Too bad we can't have wedding in, in about every two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sally Gibbs Beebe, and I am the daughter of Margaret Page and Ruth Page was my aunt. Their parents were Osborne, known as OA, and Inez Page. Inez was formerly an Alice, and she was first cousin to Dudley Lover. So we have our home here in Spartan for quite so many generations. 
the house is up on what was known as Page Hill, but now they call it Hawks Hill. And it's been here for uh, well, my grandfather uh, got the farm from his parents, so it's been many generations. So this is uh, uh, letters from home to Page Girls, dated September 1944, page 6. On August 11th, the, the Women's Community Club held their annual fair. That was a marked success. We understand that besides having a lot of fun, they made some real dough. Anyway, they had some nice exhibits, and the supper was a honey. The program put on later in the evening seemed to please the audience, if applause is any indication. There was a skit by Elaine, Faye, and Norman Piper. Recitations by Peggy and Mary Westbrook, who also sang a couple of songs, and another skit by the Pipers and Buddits, assisted by Peg Westbrook. Ruth Page and Margaret Gibbs put on a sister act in which Ruth played descriptive music on the piano, while Margaret made quick drawings in colored crayons. Those quickies are simply amazing. Margaret sure whips them out, and they always chime right in with Ruth's music. And just one is dated July 1945, age six. Margaret Page Gibbs writes from Texas, where she is visiting Gerald. But the day she arrived there, it was 112 in the shade. She says that even the local Texans allowed that it was tolerable hot. So my father was stationed down at Big Springs in the Army Air Corps doing airplane maintenance. So the next letter, the final letter, is dated January 1946, page 2. Margaret Page Gibbs has been entering into the life of the heart with all the been imaginable. She tells me that Gerald can't seem to get any light on the subject of his discharge. It was up to the pages. I was up to the pages. He done what's broke. I was up to the pages on the old skis a few days ago and can report that Osborne and I knees seem to be very well. <laughs> now, I'm going to start with her. Now, I'm going to start with her. Now, I'm going to start with her. I'm not a good start. Anyway, uh, I'm John Levitt, of course, son of Dudley and Hilton Levitt. And I live up on the Eureka Farm, I've been there all my life. Still hear me? Uh, back in 1943, on October 29th, it was Halloween night, and I was out in the barn with my brother, two brothers, my father and my grandfather, and I was just a kid about seven years old, <coughs> and we were going to have a Halloween party down here in East Barn at the Grinch House. Well, I, I was in a barn and I was bored because they were milking the cows and taking a long time and I wanted to go to the barn. So I went out in the back of the barn and then up there there was an old gasoline engine that my father had been throwing silo over and it had blown up. So the cap on the top of the gears was exposed and it was dark at night and I got that old wheel going around which made the gears go around and I couldn't see what I was doing 
And I was pretending that that was my car. And when I went to shift my car, my little finger went down between the gears. And shoot it all up. Because I didn't know what, I couldn't see. And my parent, my father, and my brothers, and my grandfather were right in the barn about 20 feet away. But all I wanted was mother. <laughs> so I walked up to the road, and down the path, down the road, up the path, knocked on the door, and held up my hand, and I said, I think I cut myself. And she said, I guess you did. <laughs> and then I started getting very weak. And I wanted to go lay down. And Mary and her brother, I don't know which one, were sent to the barn to get my dad. And he came in and called the doctor in South Wales. And the doctor said to bring him over. So they loaded me in the truck. I don't remember who went into the truck. It was an old 39 Ford that Danny talked about. They bought in 1943. <clears throat> and we came down by the grade hall, and I can remember the lights all on in the grade hall, meaning the party was going to begin pretty soon, and I was going to miss it. So we went to South Wales, and the doctor unraveled the sheet that my mother had wrapped around it. And the doctor said, take this boy to Hanover. So we went headed for Hanover down in White River. I got sick and had to stop the truck. And I picked him up. And then we went to Hanover, but I don't remember going into the hospital. The only thing I remember was in the hospital, laying on the operating table, and they were showing pictures, extra pictures. And then the nurse put on her car full of ether on my nose and said, if you don't like that smell, take a deep breath and blow it off. And so I did. <laughs> and she, she said, no, you didn't blow it off. You have to take another deep breath. And the next time I woke up, it was the next day. <laughs> and I had a lot of ether. And my mother was there, and I wanted to show her my finger, and she said they had taken it off, so it wasn't there. And I said, well, Uncle Walter Piper had fingers, and he got caught in some type of a machine, and they were halfway out, halfway gone. So I figured mine would, would grow back out also. <laughs> but I thought he was growing back out. So anyway, uh, Kennedy was laughing that people had said here before. And my aunt Gail Heron went to North Arbor on the store with her husband Earl. And she brought down a box of chocolates. Imagine that. They're laughing of all the candy. And I had a whole box of chocolates. And the nurse took them and put them in a place where I could not get hold of them. And whenever she came into the room, I would say, you know what, Doctor? If I can have one too. <laughs> so, oh, she got her chocolates and I got mine. And every time my mother came down, I hope more cried like crazy. And she came out from the four times. <clears throat> but that, I was so lonely. <laughs> That's why I figured I could tell her story. And I get to her mother with it. But after being there a little while, I got pneumonia. And so then I had to be underneath a sheet, you know, a rack over my bed, and a sheet over that, and they pumped in steam. 
And I had to stay there for, I think it was about 12 days when I was there, a mark. And I was in the hospital just for that. Five years went to bed, I had to stay there for two days. We'd be home the next day, or the same day. But see you how know, I got that pneumonia? I had to stay for a long time. And finally, I did, oh, one thing. While in the hospital, they have windows, of course. And I am so glad that those windows were not open. If they had opened, I would have climbed out and probably wouldn't be hanging out. Because I just wanted to escape. I wanted to get out of there. But the windows were not open. They were all tight. And then, after the 12 or 13 days, Elder Willie and my mother came down and took me home. And the next day I walked up the road and looked down where, where I got my finger. But I didn't come down there. I just couldn't. So that's my story. Could you give that to Patrick Kell? This was you, Patrick. Clay was doing a wonderful job of pinch hinting for you. He that. didn't Thank show you. up. <laughs> He's got his own coming up. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Patrick Kell. I uh, bought a house around the corner uh, in the village about uh, in 2016. I'm raising three kids right here in the village. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is from Elmer Bennett. Uh, I live in what was the Stunson's house, previously the Ottinger's house, and I believe the Bennett's before that. Mm -hmm. But uh, can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear me? Okay, I'll go a little louder. <laughs> All right. So, uh, March 1943, page three. Elmer Bennett tapped his first tree February 6th. Why all the delay, Elmer? You are four days late this year. We also have to report that Elmer happened to be at the store when George Tenney came along with his mail. Elmer took his mail and shortly later started along home with that. Pretty soon we saw him coming back up the road with a broom sweeping diligently. Gall, he had dropped one of the letters. After he made a couple of trips and finally given up hope of ever seeing it again, a couple of the boys at the store went along with him, and to the accompaniment of his dirge, that it's no use, we will never find it now. They searched along the road and finally found it just about three rods from the dooryard. <laughs> uh, March 1944, page 5. The last big snowstorm we had, the plow came along and opened up the road. Then just as everyone had finished shoveling out the corners, the ding busted thing came back again and widened out. In this operation, it completely covered Elmer's blankety blank mailbox. <laughs> Elmer vowed in the most picturesque language that he could be hornswoggled if shoveled out the Galvin box. No, sir, by gad, sir, he's write a bloody letter to the by gosh postmaster general, so he would. <laughs> <laughs> July 1944, page 6. Elmer Bennett tried to telephone Bill Mason a few days ago, but found the line busy. You know how impatient Elmer is. Gal and he could drive down and see Bill before those blanky blank old hens got through gassing on the gosh didn't telephone. <laughs> so jumping into Leap and Lena, he took off down the road, hell bent for leather. Just as he rounded the corner at the little brick, Harry Winchell, who was pinch hidden from George Ainsworth on the mail route, came along. Harry almost stood his car on its radiator, it didn't stop while Elmer pretty near landed in the lower pasture before he could bring it bring Lena to a halt. As a matter of fact, he thinks she fainted as it was several minutes before Elmer could get the ga old gal underway again. Never a dull moment on this corner. November 1945, page 4. Elmer Bennett again figures in the news. It seems Floyd Van Alstyne was driving down the Barnard Road a few days ago and overtook Elmer, who was afoot. Floyd stopped and took him aboard. It didn't take Elmer long to tell Floyd the news. 
He had been chopping wood up the road, and after he got home, he couldn't find his doll and iron teeth. Well, he went back and hunted all around the place until he finally located the doll and iron things right there in the blankety blank mud. <laughs> How lucky Darren, <laughs> he said, that he hadn't tried on the damn blank thing, dog. <laughs> I'm Don Lovejoy. I live down Broadbrook, right down the bottom of the hill where Mr. Powers' place is. And I lived there for about, uh, about 10 years. And then we got to down the Free Farm House. And the reason for that is Mr. Powers looked at the land up on the hill where the Powers' house is, and the Federal Land Bank was on it. My father worked in there for a land bank, and he's the first one to meet Mr. Powers. Mr. Powers came up with the property. And Mr. Powers bought the property there and four of the five of the farms up the book there. The 10, 1944, page 9. Great excitement. Carla Lovejoy is a proud father of a fine big boy, Donald Charles Lovejoy. Both Mrs. Lovejoy and the young man are doing just then and now in that enthusiasm. March 45, page 7. Tell us our celebrated B.E. Day in the most peculiar, not to say damn expensive, manner. He was up in the woods to help above the old barley place for the tractor. The barley place is for the Bowling Free Farm farm and houses now. He dismounted the open this time the track open the far away to the field. What did the machine in here? When he was wrestling with the bars, the captain took the big his key and lit down the hillside clear to the wall, to the wall back of the house where it came up wham. Both foot stripped off the bottom and Frank raised it up and in fact there wasn't a much to pick up except scrap. Now that's damn hard luck any man's language. <laughs> Hi, I'm Randy Levitt, John Dan's brother, and my favorite storyteller, John Levitt's nephew. Uh, I have a lot of family I've already spoken today, and a large family in this valley. I'm proud of all of them. So, I live down Broad Brook. I used to, comically, I thought, call it uh, deepest, darkest Royalton on the last house in the town of Royalton, but it's actually true now, because you can't get there. <laughs> so this was, uh, this is November 1943, uh, letters from, from Clay Hill, which is the site of the washout, which is causing us not to use Broad Brook Road for the next year. Clay Hill, 1943, Clay Hill, between the school and the pipers, got so wet this season that it just up and sat down the crack, developed four inches from the outside wheel jack, and the whole shebang slid right down into the brook. Huh? <laughs> they put a gas shovel on the job, and are digging back into the hill, and casting the something over the bank so that the roadway will be shifted back from the shoulder about about his own width, and they were not able to get any gravel on it before the snowstorm. So we judge it will be there the day of, of the day uh, spring comes. 1943. Okay, and the next letter says, Walter Piper, now he lived down there, right? Walter Piper had an exciting day a few weeks ago. He was hauling hay on the hill across from the Brook School, beside Maude Moore's old place. My son actually lives in that school. As he was driving the tractor across the face of the hill, which you will remember stands right on edge at this point, the darn thing reared up on two wheels, and for a couple of lengths, Walter didn't know whether to unload himself or not. She finally settled down, however, leaving Walter in a cold sweat. He had just begun to recover from his scare when he started up the hill with the hay loader in tow, and all of a sudden the coupling pin came adrift, and the loader started down the hill right smack for the schoolhouse. Walter jumped off and tried to head the damn thing 
but it threw him like a bucking bronco. He just laid there waiting for the crash, but none came. So he slowly turned his head and took a quick peek. There she was, kind of nestling down in a clump of wild cherry brush in the trees where she had tangled up at the foot of the hill. There wasn't a mite of damage to the loader or to the school. As for Walter's nerds, oh boy, they were jangled. That guy must have had a rainbow over his shoulder. Mary Van Olsen Fox, and this is a letter from home, Ella, Ella Roberts. December 1943, page one. We have another new member of the Harvest Service Club to introduce this issue, and Ella Roberts has joined in the waves. She has been accepted and sworn in and expects to report for duty about March 5th. March 1944, page two. On March 5th, Ella Roberts wrote us from the Naval Air Station at Pasco, Washington, where she is stationed. What machine? Oh, manicure. Oh, man oh, manicure. Oh, manicuring aircraft and such like. Page, April 1944, page two. Now we come to a swell letter from Ella Roberts dated at Pasco, Washington, April 2nd. Ella has a new job. She is on the 4 p.m. to midnight shift. We suppose in the Navy you say watch as B.S. Cokey, who handling of the telephone teletop and the mail. May 1944, page one. When we have a dandy long letter from Ella Roberts dated May 7th from Pasco, Washington. Ella tells us that the old man of her outfit has ports on order out, of, out to the effect that the waves mustn't do any more sunbathing. Isn't that just like a man that we ask you? June 1944, page two. We received a small letter from Ella Roberts dated June 7th at Pasco. Ella says that they've been having a series of fires out there and that she, with everyone else, has had to wrestle with them for about a week before they were able to get topside of them. Please note, everyone, that Ella is now a specialist first class, and she won the other girl with the only ones at Pasco past the examination. Fifteen tried, so congratulations are certainly due to Ella. July 44, page 2. On June 27, Ella Roberts wrote a letter from Pasco. She has got herself a new job in the photographic laboratory. And her address is now Photo Studio Ship Service Naval Air Station, Pasco, Washington. Poor Ella has to have a new set of tetanus shots due to the fact that the ones given her at Camp Hunter were never recorded. Ella tells, says they took some movies of the doings at the station the day she wrote. Maybe we can get a slant at them someday when the newsreels hit back up. August 1945, page 3. And now comes a nice long letter from Ella Roberts dated at Pasco, August 1st. They say that a woman can't keep a secret, but in spite of the fact that Ella hasn't written or said one word about what is going on in Pasco, we now learn that one of the big plants working on the atomic bomb is located right out there on the desert at Pasco. February 1945, page 8. We regret to report that about the first week of February, Mr. and Mrs. Gates received word that Beecher had been killed in action in Luxembourg on January 21st. This is the first fatality of this immediate neighborhood. And everyone is simply dumb, or simple but impressive. Everyone is shocked. A simple but impressive memorial service was held for Beecher at the Congregational Church of South Florida. We know you will be shocked. 
May we send sincere sympathy out to all members of his family. April 4th, April 1945, page 4. Fellows and girls, we have some very sad news for you. The ranks of the harbor have been broken again. We have just received word that Harold de Grasse was killed in Germany on April 6th. This word came from Mrs. Sister Ruby, so we can only accept it as official. We had known that he was missing for some time, but we have continued to hope he would turn up one or another of the prison camps. We know you all join us in extending our sincere sympathy to the members of this family. Harold was a swell lad and a good soldier. May God rest his soul. <laughs> Dog poison also. This is Letters from Home Store Fire. January 1946, page 5. A couple weeks ago, we had a little excitement in the village. About 10 o'clock one morning, a little more came to our door in great excitement. Same way the store was a fire. We rushed over the ladder, pail, and water, breaking bars and ants. Help the Lord, who had happened to be in the village. So friends me up to Dudley Levitt for a stork pump. Galen was up in the space under the roof, and we passed him up two pails of water. It seemed like the chimney caught fire, and the roof force took fire too. Anyway, after about half an hour, the exciting work, the darn thing was put out to keep. No damage resulted. But it was, might well have been a bad time if it hadn't been handled properly. <sighs> this is rather personal. This is about my parents. And they're, this is from September 43, page 7. And their various guests have been coming to most of the village affairs this summer. Uh, power to one, we are sure glad to see them and hope that they had a good enough time so that they will keep it up. Now, I will tell you how they kept it up. They would start saving gas coupons in January so they could have enough gas to get their 1939 Plymouth station wagon up here from Alamo, New York. And then she would save some more and go back in the fall to put me in school, as well as my brother and sister. The next one is August 44. Mr. and Mrs. Powers and their four children are frequent, are frequent visitors to, at the village while Mrs. Powers is only able to spend part of the summer on their place. Still, the rest of the family provides considerable power to the valley sort of the Broadbrook Valley, Broadbrook Valley Authority. Tennessee, with its TVA, ain't got nothing on us. Thank you. <laughs> My name's Harry Harrington. I don't live around here. I'm just one of the thousands of people that pass through this walk every day. And when I read about this presentation on the uh, Vermont Historical Society web page, uh, I would like to honor one of Vernon's clients. Uh, as this nice young lady to my uh, has pointed out, war has a dark side uh, that isn't very pleasant. So I would like to introduce to you uh, Charles Edward Sewell. That's S O U L E. He was born here in Barnard in 1950, the son of William Jackson Sewell. He enlisted in the Vermont National Guard in 1940, and his unit, Company G, of the 172nd Infantry, was called to active service in 
February of 1941. He and the rest of his company and the regiment uh, traveled to the South Pacific aboard the SS Coolidge, which was sunk after striking uh, their own mines in the harbor at a spirit example. Out of the 5,000 people on that ship, there were only uh, four who didn't make it. Charles did. He, he survived the crash, and he went on to uh, fight in battles until 15 July 1945, when he was killed in action. He didn't. He didn't write this letter, uh, but he showed up in it. And it's a story as written by a Corporal Michael Manal, also Company G. 84 days without a break in a period in which no one knew from one day to the next whether or not they would see the end. During the campaign, we were known as the Barracudas, named for the deadly fish of the deep sea. We underwent special training for soldiers from New Hampshire, Rhode Island, North Carolina, Ohio, Arkansas, and several other states. We landed on North, North, we landed on Randova at dawn on June 30, and we hit the beach fast. For two days, we had sporadic opposition. Staff Sergeant Alan Blaney of Windsor became the first from the company to die. He got hit during the air raid as he ran for cover. The company started from the Munda Trail behind the advanced units when we passed a smash zero. When we saw the pilot was dead, we realized the Japanese were not supermen that we had been told about. The pilot was just another guy. At night, when we dug in, we took a lot of harassing fire from snipers but prevented the enemy from coming through the lines. The next day, we advanced faster than our supplies to keep up. The company moved through thick vegetation and swamps, sometimes up to their hips in slimy swamp water, until we came to the beach and started to push towards Munda Airfield. We lost men along the way. PFC Charles E. Sewell, Sergeant Hugh F. Farrington, and Private John J. Franklin, but we blasted the Japanese all along the way. Staff Sergeant Carlton R. Bashur of Windsor popped on top of a tank and guided it right into a pillbox. Others attacked pillboxes with grenades. The skirmishes continued for days as we eliminated the enemy. Our casualties rose still. Staff Sergeant Edward J. O'Brien stepped up and took command of the company when our company commander was wounded. Heavy artillery played a big part in the final assault on the airfield, and we assaulted and captured Mortar Hill, and our mortar squads and machine gun crews began to work as riflemen and scouts. Two days later, Munda fell, and we returned to the beach. That's an excerpt from a letter written as it appeared in the January 1944 edition of the Springfield Report. Uh, Charles is uh, buried in Woodstock, in the cemetery there. Uh, but today, uh, just as an aside, I was out at Randolph at the Veterans Cemetery and I was doing some research on the Colin Area Project. And it, at random, we went up to one of the, one of the uh, niches in the Colin Area just to measure the size of, of the faceplate. And the name on that particular granite is Carol Jackson Sewell. Mm -hmm. William Jackson it was uh, Charles's father. Um, there's, there's got to be a connection in there somewhere. And it's, it's just an amazing coincidence that that's the niche that I've stepped up to. Carol uh, is a uh, veteran of the Korean War. I saw a blue star banner here. I think that is a well, World War II uh, blue star banner, but they're still in use. Right after 9 11, when the Vermont Air National Guard started to you know, go to uh, Southwest Asia or the Middle East, at each departure ceremony, the uh, American Legion would come in and 
present to each one of the airmen with one of those blue starred animals. And in the case of Charles, he, his parents would have had a blue star banner, but after he was killed in action, they would have changed that star to the goal he continued to fly that in the world. Thank you for letting me in the room. Well, that concludes the pro. Oh, news. Yes, John, coming up. That concludes the program, but I'm going to get refreshments out here and I'm going to make a dash to the drink hall to get that honor roll so that we can all get a good squint at it. And I'm sure there are any number of people here that you might want to talk to about some of the things you've read about. And for all of you that read, thank you. Thank you both for your very clear, wonderful interpretation and for not breaking down in laughter at a few of the passages. <laughs> okay.